Good evening, and welcome to this evening's edition of Tisky Sour. I'm Aaron Bastani, filling in once again for Michael Walker. And boy, do we have a show for you tonight. Liz Truss may be the new Prime Minister, but I'm joined by the only girl boss that matters. Ash, I know you died a little bit inside when I said that. How are you? I'm good. And Aaron, I actually prepared a special joke for you tonight. How many comedians does it take to derail a politics show? I don't know. One. And it's not funny. <laughs> that whole situation makes me laugh. Uh, I don't want that to be an indictment on your joke, Ash, which is also very funny. More of that later. Of course, we are discussing the scenes on yesterday's uh, Laura Coonsbug on Sunday show. Uh, remember, we want your thoughts on tonight's topics, and they are big. You can tweet at us using the hashtag Tisky Sour and in the comments. Mary Elizabeth Truss has become Britain's newest Prime Minister after defeating Rishi Sunak in the Conservative leadership race. But it's certainly not the landslide win that some in her camp might have expected. Here are the results. Liz Truss received 57% of the vote to Sunak's 43%. This makes Truss the first of the past five Tory leaders elected under the current rules to receive less than 60% in the members' ballot. Following the result, Liz Truss gave her acceptance speech. Friends and colleagues, thank you for putting your faith in me to lead our great Conservative Party, the greatest political party on earth. I know that our beliefs resonate with the British people. Our beliefs in freedom, in the ability to control your own life, in low taxes, in personal responsibility. And I know that's why people voted for us in such numbers in 2019. And as your party leader, I intend to deliver what we promised those voters right across our great country. <laughs> During this leadership campaign, I campaigned as a conservative and I will govern as a Conservative. <laughs> and my friends, we need to show that we will deliver over the next two years. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. And I will deliver on the National Health Service. But we all will deliver for our, for our country. And I will make sure that we use all the fantastic talents of the Conservative Party, our brilliant members of parliament and peers, our fantastic councillors, our MSs, our MSPs, all of our councillors and activists and members right across our country. Because my friends, I know that we will deliver, we will deliver, or we will deliver. And we, and we, and we will deliver a great victory for the Conservative Party in 2024. Thank you, thank you. Ash, do you think Truss is weaker than she seems? She's, like I say, the fifth leader on this method, the first to get below 60%. Even Ian Duncan Smith cleared that. Does that matter? I think it does matter because if you look at how Conservative Party leaders reach the end of their political career, it's through regicide. It's when they lose the confidence of their own backbenchers, those backbenchers and sometimes, of course, members of cabinet organise to defenestrate that leader. So if you don't have the galumphing majority that you were 
predicted to get amongst the membership. And of course, you are inheriting a deeply divided parliamentary party. That's a very weak position. And that's just purely in terms of the uh, parliamentary and the party mechanics. That's before you get into the kind of political situation that she's inheriting from her predecessor, Boris Johnson. And here's something which I would say about Liz Truss is that if you compare her to every previous Conservative Party leader from David Cameron onwards, it was very clear what they were expected to do. David Cameron was elected and expected to gut the public sector. He installs a Chancellor of the Exchequer who is going to introduce some of the most brutal austerity measures of Western Europe. And that was what he did. He did what he set out to do. Theresa May was thrust upon the members by the parliamentary party. She essentially uh, came to the leadership position because she was a uh, party to a coronation. And that was because what the MPs thought they wanted at the time was a unifying figure who could deal with the Brexit rifts and cobble together some kind of compromise position. Now, of course, that wasn't what the membership wanted. And that's why you ended up with Theresa May getting defenestrated as well. Now, a Along comes Boris Johnson. When it comes to Boris Johnson, his limitations as a candidate were obvious. Self-serving, not particularly disciplined, uh, somebody whose personal integrity was, you know, about as reliable as, you know, a Kia Picanto that's already been driven into a river. But what he was expected to do, and indeed what he was able to do, it was put together a Brexit, which would be palatable to Brexiteers and also defeat Jeremy Corbyn by a big enough margin that it removes the threat of socialism from the British political arena for at least a few years. Boris Johnson did that. Now, what is Liz Truss here to do? There's what the members like about her, which is, you know, she sings from the low tax hymn book. She surrounds herself by in, with individuals from the Adam Smith Institute and the Institute for Economic Affairs. But what's her political project? What is she supposed to do? Right. She doesn't have, I think, that sense of guiding purpose. And I think without that and without a large enough majority amongst the membership and without also commanding totally uh, unquestionable support from the MPs, then yeah, her position is perhaps a lot more vulnerable than she would like and a lot more vulnerable than previous Conservative Party leaders. So well said. Uh, and as we'll talk about later on the show, you have to remember, as recently as July, uh, I think less than a third of Tory MPs actually wanted her to be their leader. Now let's talk about the losing candidate, Rishi Sunak. Nobody really expected him to be the winner today with his campaign struggling in polling for the past six weeks. But the results were, other than what YouGov were predicting, they were well off the money. They predicted a 27-point margin of victory for trust in the final week of campaigning. In the end, it was a difference of 13. On the campaign strategy of Sunak, Politico reported a campaign member saying that Sunak had done 130 events plus official hustings and met around 30,000 people. They estimated trust had done less than half of Sunak's member events. Today, Sunak tweeted this. Thank you to everyone who voted for me in this campaign. I've said throughout the Conservatives are one family. It's right, we now unite behind the new PM, Liz Truss, as she steers the country through difficult times. Ash, why did Liz Truss go so easy on campaigning towards the end? And what next for Dishy Rishi? Well, okay. When it comes to why did she ease off towards the end, it's because she could afford to. She knew that she had the membership in the bag. And really, she has been running a shadow campaign for the top job for quite a while now with all of those prime ministerial looking photo shoots. We all knew that this was one of Liz Truss's ambitions. She was confident that she could pitch to a radicalised membership who want to hear from a you know, Poundland Thatcherite Tribute Act, and she had that in the bag. So I think that that's why she was able to ease off in the way that she did. Whereas Rishi Sunak, I think, ended up in a really quite funny position. One is that he was loathed for sticking the knife into Boris Johnson with his 
fateful resignation, but also he had to carry the can for lots of the policies that the Conservative Party members thought were unpopular during the Johnson era. So really, you almost have to feel sorry for him. He simply couldn't win. He got the shit portion of the shit sandwich. God love him. Um, What next for him? Well, he knows that he's got a career and indeed a green card waiting for him in the United States should he ever want that. But I wonder if he would be looking at the kind of structural vulnerability of Liz Truss's position and think to himself, maybe I've got a second run at this. I think that's a really, really, really good point, Ash. We'll talk about Boris Johnson too. But like you say, you've got these competing centres of power now, and it's important to say Rishi Sunak will not be offered a job in Liz Truss's cabinet. He's very much on the outside. Of course, Boris Johnson going to the back benches. On the subject of other outgoing cabinet ministers, Priti Patel has resigned this evening as Home Secretary. Truss has been tipped to be making her replacement Suella Breverman. There was a moment at the beginning of Truss's acceptance speech I want to show you. It concerns her predecessor. I also want to thank our outgoing leader, my friend, Boris Johnson. (laughs) Boris, you got Brexit done. You crushed Jeremy Corbyn. You rolled out the vaccine and you stood up to Vladimir Putin. You were admired from Kiev to Carlisle. Oh, my goodness. The reaction to Trust thanking Johnson, that's why I was just laughing, was strangely muted. Perhaps that's because Truss and her colleagues still have one eye on her predecessor. He apparently thinks he still has a future in frontline politics. And remember, Truss herself was only backed by less than a third of her colleagues in late July. Johnson and Sunak will always be ambitious, whatever else. Boris Johnson's chief of staff, Lord Udney Lister, told Times Radio, never say never about Johnson making a comeback in the future, he added. He is a very formidable operator. He is somebody who has proved and been able to surprise people time after time. I think when you see him outside, presumably beyond politics, when you see some of the stuff I suspect he'll end up writing and speaking about, people will realise they really have lost a first-rate person. But thankfully, thankfully, he's staying in the comments. Ash, Liz Truss has replaced Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party, but is he the kind of person to make life easy for the person replacing him in the top job? Well, look, Boris Johnson was catapulted to the top job because he served particular purposes for the establishment, defeating Jeremy Corbyn, getting Brexit over the line, and also because he had an absolutely you know, an ending supply of weapons grade entitlement. Despite the fact he was patently unqualified for any of the great positions of state that he's ever held, foreign secretary, of course, prime minister, and also before that mayor of London, the fact that he uh, characterized his time in those positions by being incredibly self-serving, being a little piggy at the trough, really. He didn't think that that should disqualify him from holding the greatest office that this country has to offer. So I don't necessarily think that he would be one to see being chucked out of the window by his MPs as a reason why he shouldn't have another crack at the top job. I also think that there's a few hiccups in that plan. One is that he is still the MP for Uxbridge. Now, Uxbridge is, of course, a London constituency with an uncomfortably slim, in national terms, majority for the Conservatives. When you look at the way that the polling's going, Uxbridge is the kind of seat which might be really vulnerable for the Conservatives in a general election. So it doesn't matter what Boris Johnson wants for himself. If he's still the MP for Uxbridge and he's going into a general election uh, headed up by Liz Truss and he loses that seat, no prime minister, no matter how much he wants it. I think also the second thing, and this is going to be something which we discuss over the course of this show and, of course, um, you know, across the shows to come, is that the scale of the economic crisis that we're sleepwalking into, I think really is truly a 
game changer. Now, that both is something in Boris Johnson's favor and something not in his favor. The reason why it's in his favor is because he had to resign not because of what he did to the country, but because of how he was seen to be unfit for holding the office that he had due to his personal integrity. Now, one of the things about politics is that scandals around personal integrity can often be forgotten when it's time to rehabilitate a certain character and usher them back into the limelight. Of course, we saw that with Peter Mandelson. We've seen that with countless politicians who've had a scandal, had to disappear for a bit and then come back. However, if Labour and the extra parliamentary left and, of course, other parties of opposition as well manage to nail the Conservatives on this present crisis as the result of of 12 years of bad governance, then Boris Johnson will be tarnished with the same brush. But that would involve both a competent opposition and a press which will not pull its punches. Those are, of course, very big ifs. But what kind of prime minister is Liz Truss set to be? That's the question we're all asking. Well, this clip from her interview with Laura Koonsberg on Sunday was instructive. You want to reverse the national insurance rise. But let's take a look at what that would mean. So if we can put our graphic up on the screen here, the poorest would stand to gain about seven pounds from that. At the top of the income bracket, the wealthiest people in the country would gain 900, maybe even nearly 2,000 pounds. Is that fair? Well, the people at the top of the income distribution pay more tax. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, when you cut taxes, Mm -hmm. you tend to benefit people who are more likely to pay tax. Of course, there are some people who don't pay tax at At all. all. Mm -hmm. But to look at everything through the lens of redistribution, I believe is wrong. Because what I'm about is about growing the economy. And growing the economy benefits everybody. But you're happy with... But this, this is a really important point because so far, the economic debate for the past 20 years has been dominated by discussions about distribution. But and what's that... happened mm-hmm. is we have had relatively low growth. So we've had no more than an it... average of 1% growth. And that has been holding our country but back. And it means... get into a debate about economic that, theory, this, this is one is... of the things that you've promised clearly. You want to do it. Absolutely. You believe it's the right thing. I do believe it, it's right. But is it fair that on this yes, decision... it is be, fair. It is fair yes, to give the wealthiest fair. people more money back. It is fair. What you're seeing there is an ideological prime minister. I'll say that again, because we arguably haven't had one of those since Margaret Thatcher, maybe Tony Blair. Liz Truss is an ideological prime minister. Liz Truss knows what she thinks on things, and agree or not, and I don't, she's not going to change her mind just to look popular. As an economic liberal and disciple of Thatcher, she doesn't think fairness or redistribution matters. She thinks they're bad, and that shouldn't surprise us. Ash, was it a fruitful line of questioning? After all, Liz Truss isn't exactly going to say, actually, you know what, I want to help low-income earners more than the rich. We know that's not her politics, and she's made that entirely clear over the course of this leadership campaign. You know, Marx once said that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. And this is truly Thatcherism as farce. I've got to say, I disagree with you a little bit, Aaron, because I don't think you can say that Liz Truss is ideological in precisely the same way as Margaret Thatcher. I think that Margaret Thatcher was a deeply strategic and indeed incredibly intelligent politician. Now, she used that strategy, that intelligence to do things to this country that I think we still bear the scars from to this very day. But I think there's no denying that she understood exactly what she was doing. Whereas Liz Truss, I think, does have some kind of commitment to these principles. She, even when she was a liberal Democrat back at uni, would describe herself as a libertarian on economics. However, she's got the kind of understanding of what she's saying that a minor bird repeating the words of their owners has of basic language. And I think it was abundantly clear from how she answered the question. She simply looked at that graph and went, yeah, rich people pay more tax seems fair to me, rather than doing what you would expect any intelligent Thatcherite to do, which is start explaining the Laffer curve, the idea that if you 
cut tax, you encourage growth, therefore you've got a bigger pot of taxes to spend and then you can use that to support people on low incomes. So that's the classic right wing economic argument, except she didn't do that. You know, and that's the sort of, you know, real economics, basic 101 defense of the kind of economics that she's supposed to be espousing. She simply looked at that graph, went, you know what? Fuck the poor. Let's move on to the next question. So, again, coming back to this, I think, really important uh, thing that we're discussing, which is what kind of politician is Liz Truss? I think central to everything that we're going to learn about her is the fact that she's not very smart. I want to I want to push back a little bit on what you said there, Ash. Uh, we we probably share a fair bit of ground here, and it's something that's bugged me recently. People say she used to be a liberal democrat, now she's a conservative. Completely inconsistent views, uh, and as you sort of hinted out there, that's that's not really true. She's been an economic libertarian her whole adult life. At Oxford, she was the president of the Liberal Democrat Society. She was also a member of the Hayek Society. So she's always been a free market liberal. That's what she believes in, and I think a lot of the co commentary in this country because they're liberals don't like to talk about the fact that there's a huge amount of continuity between Thatcherism and that strand of liberalism, what was called more recently orange book liberalism, people like Nick Clegg, and they are bedmates. And actually, they're just as likely to go into a coalition as we saw after 2010 as Labour are with the Liberal Democrats over social issues. So she is ideological in so much as I don't feel she will chase public sentiment and popularity in the way that Boris Johnson or Blair would. I think with Cameron and Osborne, the pursuit of austerity wasn't ideological. I think it served two purposes. The first was to differentiate themselves from Labour after 2008. And boy, it worked. The media lapped it up just because they were basically bored of Labour. They fancied a change. Okay, let's have the Tories. Now 60% public debt to GDP is a national crisis, although nobody talks about it anymore. So that wasn't ideology. It was more about sort of political opportunism. And so I do think Truss is somebody who embeds her analyses and her policies, although not in the short term, they're very, very interventionist with a big state, in theory, in ideas that she's been engaging with for 30, 40 years, that is that is a break with people like Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Cameron, Osborne, or, or, or do you think I'm misreading that? I guess I think you're misreading it a bit. Of course, the really big test of whether or not she cares about popularity will be what she does or doesn't do to protect households and small businesses from the rising wholesale cost of energy. All right. That's going to be the really big test of how much she's willing to adapt from some of the core principles she's espoused during this campaign. But I do think that the values that she holds have very shallow roots. And while I don't think she's somebody who adapts according to what she would think will be most popular in a general sense, which was, of course, what Boris Johnson did. And it was something that he was able to do because he was surrounded by advisors who looked at long term trends in terms of what we call red wall seats and were able to identify the things needed to bring them over to the conservatives once and for all. I think that Liz Truss adapts herself to a very small group of uh, think tank bankers, political insiders, spads and MPs that she happens to find herself uh, surrounded by. And that's why I say that she's got the quality of a minor bird. It's about the individuals around her, I think, and not the country at large. I think that's fair. And I think also you, you made the comment about Thatcher being a much more talented politician. I would agree entirely with that. I don't think Liz Truss is a particularly good politician. Although, of course, let's see. We've been surprised by politics over the last decade, and this may be one of those moments. Liz Truss's political intray is overwhelming. From war in Ukraine to rampant inflation, ambulance waiting times, and an imminent recession, there is a lot to get on with. But number one on that list is to address the central part of the cost of living crisis, namely spiraling energy bills. Over the weekend, it was reported that Team Truss has a £100 billion package ready and waiting that will fund scrapping last April's national insurance increase, the proposed increase to corporation tax, and a likely cut to VAT, as well as, seemingly, a freeze on the price of energy at today's levels all the way through to Christmas. It'll be revisited after then. That last one alone could cost around £30 billion. Now, I'm loath to cite the Sun newspaper, but they confirmed the story of that £100 billion figure earlier today. Previously, it was just speculation. 
Liz Truss set to unveil a £100 billion cost of living rescue package to make Britain work in first week as PM. Now, this looks like it could be really decisive action. And that's no accident, because despite Truss's small state ideology, the Tories know this has to be dealt with and fast. If she doesn't make an impression before October and those winter nights draw in, it could be curtains for Truss before it starts. That's all the more true because Truss starts the job with remarkably little political capital. The numbers here are quite extraordinary. Just 22% of the public, slightly more than one in five, are fairly or very pleased that Liz Truss is the next prime minister. Meanwhile, 50% are disappointed. Only 4% are very pleased, not much enthusiasm there. And even among Tory voters, those pleased she is the next PM amount to less than half. But this next table is even more interesting. 2% of the public has a lot of confidence that Liz Truss has the right policies to address the cost of living crisis. That rises to just 5% for Tory voters. Conservative voters who have no confidence in Truss addressing the biggest issue of the day amount to 54%. That compares to 35% who think she has what it takes. Facing the most challenging period in recent history, not even a majority of Tory voters think the PM can do the job. So she's got to hit the ground running and make an impression. Team Truss are mooted to cut VAT from 20 to 15%. That would reportedly save the average household more than £1,300 a year, although at a cost of £38 billion to the Exchequer. But it's decisive action on energy this week, which the new PM hopes will turn the tide. Ash, are the Tories finally seeing sense on energy bills, or am I being too credulous? Do I belong in the lobby with all the rest of them? <laughs> Well, look, let's see what the actual details of this plan are. And because Liz Truss said she would rule out any further tax increases, and that includes windfall taxes on oil and gas giants, how is this going to be paid for? Is it going to be something which will be all borrowing, and therefore Tories will want to be uh, offset by <clears throat> cuts to public sector spending? Or is it going to be something which is going to be paid for by uh, you know increasing the tax intake somewhere? I think that's going to be something really, really key to watch out for. I think the second thing to point out is that Liz Truss, as far as I can make out, and again, this might be one of those hostage to fortune predictions, which will be totally uh, kiboshed by the coming weeks. But I don't think that Liz Truss wants to go for a general election right away. I think that her plan, and this has been the case throughout the campaign, and I think it will be the case when she assumes office, is to go hell for leather in shoring up GDP. Now, of course, shoring up GDP doesn't mean you actually uh, improve or indeed even protect living standards for everybody. You can have low or sluggish growth uh, and have it be very unequally distributed and the poor have a terrible time. Um, but her plan has, been, has been to increase GDP. Now, you can't do that if the tsunami of energy bills facing this country wipe out not just low-income households, but middle and even some higher-income households as well, and absolutely rips through small to medium businesses where, of course, their energy cap, their energy costs aren't capped in the same way. So I think that Liz Truss's big idea is to go into the next general election being like, look, the line went up. And that means that you will have to have some level of state intervention beyond slashing taxes in order to deal with the impact of energy costs on households and businesses. The first edition of the BBC's Sunday with Laura Koonsberg started with a bang. But that was less to do with the big hitting interviews with Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss than a surprisingly upbeat supporter of the new Tory party leader. We have the attitude and we have the spirit and, and, to deal with the and challenges we may we well, And we may well have Liz Truss in number 10 on Tuesday. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. And whatever you. happens, Thank do you. come back. Well, I was going to say, Fitness. going for some reaction from our panel, because listening to that interview at the desk and seeming to applaud Joe Lysett, the comedian, Cleo Watson, who has lots and lots of experience in number 10, because she worked for Theresa May and Boris Johnson. Now, Joe, I'm going to let you calm down a bit before I ask you what you thought I love of it. it. Exactly. Um, well done, Liz. <laughs> what did you make of it? Now, have you calmed down? She has to go I'm from not, the I'm... campaign to the country. But tell us honestly what you thought. Well, so... 
you said earlier that I'm not left or right. I'm actually, I know that there's been criticism in the, uh, the Mail on Sunday today about lefty, liberal, wokey comedians on the BBC. I'm actually very right wing and I loved it. I thought she was very clear. She gave great, clear answers. I know exactly what she's up to. And I think she's, uh, most people watching at home who are worried about their bills are going to feel... There's a serious point, Joe. Forgive me. There's a I'm serious point. I'm not being sarcastic. Point. Absolutely. She said that there was a big package of help coming this week yeah. for people to help pay their bills. She was very clear what she said. And I, I, I think you know exactly what's going to happen. I think you're reassured. I'm reassured. Are you reassured? Well, Emily Thornbury, so reassured. you're smirking over there in the corner. But, Joe, politics can be very, very unpredictable. I mean, mm. let's look at two different opinions in the papers this yes. morning. You have a columnist, um, Matthew Syed, who's basically predicting that it's going to be a nightmare and that the leadership contest has been out of touch with the country. But Janet Daly in The Telegraph says, look, actually, Liz Truss is stronger than you think. If she gets cracking, yeah. gets out there, she might be Fair able to... to Janet. I think, you know, the haters will say that we've had 12 years of the Tories and that we're sort of at the dregs of what they've got available and that Liz Truss is sort of like the backwash of the available MPs. I wouldn't say that because I'm incredibly right wing. But some people might say that. But the consensus, though, in politics is often wrong, right? Yeah. And it is. Often, it's often wrong, and we often don't know what is going to pan out. Yeah. Well, as, as Liz said there, she said she would be wrong to predict the future, even though loads of people have predicted that we're going to have real issues with paying our energy bills. But, um, you know, I think she's right to just then just sort of basically say, well, let's not predict and see what happens next week. I okay. think she did the right thing there. That was comedian Joe Lysett, whose appearance on the show went viral on social media. Of course, his support for Liz Truss, it should be said, was satirical. Now, in Lysett's defense, he wasn't exactly hiding what he had planned. Here's what he tweeted the day before the show. Really excited to be on this new version of Would I Lie to You? <laughs> now, Joe Lysett has 1.1 million Twitter followers, so you'd presume that a producer would have noticed that. Apparently not. It didn't end there. After the show, Lysett had a picture taken with Laura Koonsberg holding a rather strange painting. Now, before you read the tweet, can you guess who it is without reading the words? Well, of course, it's Laura Koonsberg's former BBC colleague and now rival at ITV, Robert Peston. Happy to present at BBC Laura K with a gift for her first show, tweeted Lysett. Something I knew she'd love. An original painting of Robert Peston in jail. Ash, how outraged are you that a comedian went on a BBC politics show and had the temerity to actually be funny? Well, you know, there's a first time for everything. So my condolences to Matt Ford, Aisha Hazarika and Jeff Norcutt, who were welcome on BBC politics shows, but have never knowingly made anybody laugh. I mean, Look, the reason why everyone's got their panties in a bunch about this is because the comedian did what his job is, which is to hold a mirror up to the court. So that didn't just include the king, i.e. Liz Truss, the person who's going for the top job, but also the entire system of obsequiousness and affected seriousness, which allows this absurd circus to continue rolling on from year to year, town to town, election to election. And I think that that was the thing which was so striking about Koonsberg's inability to handle what he was doing, which is it is the job of everybody in that room to treat politics with a seriousness which its present state simply does not deserve. So you can be pro Liz Truss or you can be anti Liz Truss, but what you can't do is question why she's got the power that she does in the first place or, you know, whether or not she'd be qualified to run a tuck shop as opposed to the entirety of the United Kingdom. And of course, politicians don't get to that position without an awful lot of help and that kind of, like I said, affected seriousness of being like, OK, we know this person's just said something which is going to make everything worse uh, for the whole country. But in the interest of balance, I've got to ask you, do you think it's a good thing? I think that he treated the entire spectacle with the exact amount of respect that it deserved. And that's why he is not going to be 
on a BBC politics panel again anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> I won't, I won't spoil this too much because we've got a lot more to talk about. And Ash, you and I go on these things, you a lot more than I, uh, and we, we can, I think, um, add a bit of value there. But before we do, the response from those parts of the media who take themselves incredibly seriously was rather predictable. How dare a comedian go on BBC politics, make us laugh. One of those criticizing precisely that behavior was Rob Burley, former executive editor for a bunch of their Westminster shows. But I'm sure he's not bitter. Rob Burley is now at LBC, where he works with Andrew Marr. Burley had a simple bit of advice. Memo. Don't put comedians on question time or any other serious political show. It's not the time for that nonsense anymore. Fair enough, you might think. After all, the cost of living crisis is extraordinarily serious. But you might be less inclined to agree when you discover that comedians regularly appear on Andrew Marr's show on LBC, produced by... Rob Burley. They have done so as recently as July, but maybe that's just because it isn't a serious political show. Who knows? Ash, I'm going to throw this back over to you. You do pay-per-view shows all the time. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to get you in trouble here, but this subversion of the form, to me, it kind of reads like the end game of what we've seen with Mick Lynch. Now, I know Mick Lynch, he confronts the media and like he kind of pierces the the platitudes, which you're meant to come up with. Um, and of course, even if you don't agree with the platitudes, you've only got 20 seconds anyway before you move on to the next story. So nobody can say anything of real significance. It's low information banality, as I like to call it on Twitter. <laughs> For somebody in those circles, in, in the sort of, in the, in the pundit class, you're not a pundit, I should say, you're a wonderful writer and journalist here at Navarra Media. What do you think about that? You know, what would your advice be to somebody, say, who's invited onto the BBC for the first time? They can make their argument. They can talk about, you know, different kinds of political standpoints. They might want to advance particular interests or groups in society. Do you think they should do that and take it seriously? Or is this really the way we should confront an increasingly bizarre and unhinged media by essentially showing it for what it is? I mean, look, there are different ways to show the media for what it is. There's, of course, that really famous tete-a-tete between Noam Chomsky and Andrew Marr, where Noam Chomsky absolutely and devastatingly lays out the fact that if Andrew Marr had been asking questions which are challenging to establishment interests, then he wouldn't even be there to conduct the interview. You've, of course, got people like Mick Lynch, who I think very skillfully, as you said, pierces the platitudes and, you know, defangs the attack lines. But he does so in order to redirect attention back on the, what he's there to do, which is uh, speak in support of his trade union and advocate his members' interests. Now, somebody like Joe Lysett, his job is to be a comedian. And I think that he did something which was quite funny. And the last thing I want to do is say, and this is the only kind of comedy that can ever be funny. The thing that I liked is that it was kind of a living embodiment and performance of shit posting, which I thought was, you know, kind of cool to see. But of course, there's many ways to be funny. What, of course, I think is dreadfully unfunny are comedians who really want to be insiders or were felt formerly insiders and then fell out of power. So then they had to pretend that everyone else would find them as funny as, you know, their colleagues at Norman Shaw House. Now, I think that that is actually the class of people who Joe Lysett really brilliantly sends up because they're so invested in the mechanisms of the court that they're never going to be able to properly satirize them. Ash, name names, and if you don't, I will. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've never found anything that Matt Ford has ever said to be funny on purpose, apart from the time he got so upset that there was a crying baby at one of his shows. Uh, not him, I should make clear they said that yeah, he should bring an infant to a comedy show and that level of thin skinness and pomposity would be hilarious if it was a character he was playing but what's actually striking the note of tragedy which of course defines uh, all great comedy is that that's his real personality see i'm gonna have to disagree with you a little bit because i think matt ford's impression of donald trump is passable i think it's a passable impression of a comedian Aisha has a reeker, on the other hand, 
is one of the least funny people I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's it's frightening, actually, how unfunny she is. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, we can have comedians on the BBC politics shows as long as they attack the left. But the minute you have a comedian coming on actually satirizing politics in a novel, interesting, really high value way, we're all talking about it because it was remarkably funny. Well, that, that's not acceptable. Do your job. You're meant to be punching down and, and admonishing socialists and and making people who want to make this country a better place look ridiculous. Do your job. Out-of-touch Tories have been a recurring theme during the cost of living crisis, and we can welcome a new addition to the genre this week. Ex-Tory MP Edwina Curry appeared on Good Morning Britain to offer this advice. Here's one of my suggestions for a, a, a tip, something that's dirt cheap. Martin knows about this sort of thing. If you put some of this behind your radiators, it really works. It makes the whole room nice and warm, and it means that you can turn down your thermostat without it causing you any more discomfort. I mean, you know, Martin and Susanna, most people my age have lived in houses without central heating, but we are dependent on it now. And just that kind of little thing makes such a difference. Uh, moving the sofa away from the radiator. You don't want to be heating the sofa. You want to be heating the room. Um, if you've got... Um, uh, Edwina, a, a, forgive me. A, a there, there's nothing, there's uh, nothing wrong fire, with... That kind of thing, you know. There's nothing wrong with the tips. And the tips are right. And there's lots of great detailed tips out there. But ultimately, let's be plain. We, are, we have an 80% rise in the price cap in October. We have another predicted 52% rise in the price cap in January. We're seven months through the 10-month assessment period of that, so that's likely to be in the right ballpark. That will bring a typical bill in the UK to £5,400 a year. Many pensioners, you're talking pensioners, tend to have bigger than typical bills because they need more heating on. £5,400 is substantially over half the full state pension, well bigger than that over the old state pension that is less, and more for people on universal credits and benefits who get less amount than that. Th th those tips you're suggesting, and I've been giving them for years, if they would work, I would be out there talking all the time only about that. They are not enough. Even Liz Trust seems to have come around to the idea that that's not enough. And I think that was what people took issue with. The idea that saying that some small tips, you know, incremental 10, 20% savings, 10 or 20% savings do not cover a 50% rise in April, 80% rise in October, and 50% rise again in January. I think that's the frustration. Yeah, but Martin, yeah, of course. And we're all very frustrated about it. And government is going to be doing a lot more. They've done a certain amount, nowhere near enough. I totally accept that. But if we none of us do anything else, if we expect everything to continue, to have the house at the same temperature, not to have to put on a sweater, uh, then we are actually not helping ourselves. And part of all of this, like through COVID, is actually helping ourselves as well as expecting mm. government but and local authorities. In Germany, for example, they, wait a minute, in Germany, they have already announced that local authorities have got to switch off street lights. They've already announced that shops have got to cut down on their lighting for their shop fronts and thing, things like that. We've got none of that. But we can take those sort of decisions. That's what really will make a difference. Mm. It goes without saying that Edwina Curry's contribution there is pretty jaw-dropping. And Martin Lewis was absolutely right to call her out. Frankly, it's insulting to suggest people can make slight tweaks to how their radiators work in the face of energy bills topping almost £4,000 a year. Full transparency. She did say later in that segment that she doesn't think government can do nothing. Indeed, she thinks they can do a lot seems terrified at the idea that government intervention should be the primary focus right now. Indeed, this segment on GMB came about because Edwina Curry objected to Martin Lewis's description of the current state of affairs as a catastrophe. That came up again on air. You surely, know surely, this. Edwina, if isn't that a catastrophe? those who can reduce their use, Edwina? it helps everybody else. Isn't it a catastrophe? Let's be it honest. It doesn't it help using words like that. But it is Martin, a catastrophe. May, you may not may want the language. It may help your mental health to do something like that. Mm. No, okay. I know. I, I, the absolutely. The language is not helpful. I'm afraid, I'm afraid you can't no. ignore the no, rise. No, it does not you help. You can't ignore the rise in bills. That's what the catastrophe is. It's not my language. It's, it's the practice of what's happening.
I mean, I, I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, how does this work? I'm freezing, but don't worry. My mental health is great because nobody's saying this is a catastrophe. I've got frostbite in my fingers and hands, but I feel really happy because everybody, people on TV, they say it's okay. So you know what? I'm feel, feeling really good today upstairs, eight out of 10. What planet are these people on? Another dose of wealthy right-wingers not getting it came in the mail on Sunday. They offered this advice to their readers. Save cash on household bills by taking a cruise. It is now almost cheaper to go on an all-inclusive holiday than it is to stay at home. How is this supposed to save cash for anyone? All it means is that it's as expensive to live at home as it is to go on a holiday abroad. Ash, this has confounded me. It's one of those where, are they being tongue-in-cheek or are they being serious? Have conservatives in the media, in broadcast and in print, completely lost the plot? I'm not sure if they ever had the plot. I mean, having the plot and a firm grasp on reality would require acknowledging several very inconvenient truths. The first thing is that we have an inflationary crisis, not because there is a wage price spiral, but because there is a profit price spiral. The second thing would be looking at the fact that in real terms, pay fell and or flatlined over the last decade. So there is not much give in people's household budgets. And then the third thing would be looking at the fact that people who are below the poverty line, people who are really destitute already and have been because of the cumulative effect of over a, de of over a decade's worth of austerity, have nowhere to go in terms of either finding new means of support or indeed cutting down on their energy use even further. Because what we know is that, of course, people on lower incomes tend to use a lot less energy than people on higher incomes. So any conversation which is remotely serious would have to acknowledge those three things. And if you can't do that because you've got a political interest not to, you are left absolutely flailing and coming into contact only with the ridiculous and presenting it to the public, um, you know, the way that someone would plate up a dog's turd and say that this is a wedding feast. It's absolutely insulting. I'd go as far as to say it's grotesque. But I do think that part of the blame lies with, I've got to say, the producers of Good Morning Britain here, because Edwina Curry tweeted her offence at the crisis being called a catastrophe. She's going to do that because she's not politically relevant unless she says more and more out loud, outlandish and offensive and caricaturish things. And I think if what you want to do is present a serious discussion to the public, where of course you can still fulfill your impartiality briefs and have somebody who's more conservative and have someone who's more left-wing. Um, but I don't think that getting Edwina Curry on is a necessity for fulfilling the uh, legally mandated balance that broadcasters have to have in this country. What I find interesting is you've got a mirroring, really, of frankly deranged story in the mail on Sunday. Save money on heating bills by going on a cruise. And that is being reflected in broadcast media. That wasn't happening to the same extent 15 years ago. And it does feel like the Jeremy Kyle mind virus has taken over the whole of broadcast media in so much as 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, daytime TV, people shouting at each other, making no sense, um, prodding at one another in this very attention-seeking way, which Edwina Curry personifies, that has now become the norm for politics and political coverage in this country. A am I just getting old, Ash, and I think, oh, in my day, it wasn't like this? Or is there something to that? Has the genre of political TV changed in a way that is designed to stimulate and provoke a response, but which is actually pretty toxic if you want to solve problems? I mean, look, I think that political media obviously has changed. And the big change has been that political media that's on broadcast is in a conversation with social media all the time. Because if you have, you know, a pretty 
healthy audience comparatively for a show like GMB, but overall your audience is getting older and will be dying out because that is the nature of television audiences. In order for you to keep reaching people, it's got to be something which will do well on social media. Now for it to do well on social media, it will probably, I think, prioritize and indeed reward what you call uh, low information content. It's stuff which stimulates emotional responses and doesn't necessarily help people learn anything new. And because of that conversation, I think it pro- it produces incentives for how current affairs conversations are curated and you know how they pan out when they're being televised. But I also think if you go back to, you know, David Cameron coming to power, a really big theme of television was finding people who were benefits recipients and making them figures of such disgust and disdain and contempt that it could provide a kind of cultural foundation for the attacks on the welfare state that he and his chancellor George Osborne then carried out. Now, I would say the way of doing that was also low information. It just wasn't necessarily as invested in the pursuit of virality, which I think shapes and dictates current affairs programming now. Ash, you have been a diamond as ever. You make this job of replacing Michael Walker so much easier. You know, I, I, I think, oh my God, I have to host tonight, but then I remember I'm being joined by Ash Sarka and my, my brain sort of elevates a few notches. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight, Ash. And thank you to everyone else who's joined us this evening. There'll be more tomorrow with Liz Truss being officially appointed as Prime Minister by the Queen. That's at Balmoral. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.